I would like to just point out a few key things uh, regarding Saturday night and indeed the reaction ever since because thousands, thousands of the great and the good on the media and on social media, including politicians from pretty much every party, have queued up to denounce the policing of the vigil on Saturday night, which saw heavy-handed, aggressive policing of peaceful women uh, meeting to remember the, uh, Sarah Everard after her murder. Um, there were, let's face it, grotesque images of burly police officers throwing young women into the ground to handcuff them uh, as they uh, met to remember a murdered woman when the chief suspect, let us not forget, charged but not yet convicted with of that crime, being a serving police officer. But isn't all of that completely beside the point? All of those images and all of the emotion and the reason why people were meeting, isn't that completely and utterly irrelevant? Either the event, whether it was a vigil or a protest, whether it was about a murdered woman or anything else, isn't the question was whether that event was legal or not? And clearly, under lockdown laws, supported by the vast majority of people in this country, that protest was not legal. It is, frankly, absurd and hypocritical for people who have hitherto cheered on ever more authoritarian rules, controlling every single aspect of our lives, barring even two people meeting in the open air to protest, to suddenly now claim that the right to protest is, even in a pandemic, sacrosanct. Even more so when some of those people are politicians like Home Secretary Priti Patel and Labour MP Jess Phillips, those who voted for those very laws. Where were they when police were manhandling people peacefully protesting lockdown rules, charging into peaceful crowds, dragging them to the ground to handcuff them? Or do they just think that lockdown laws banning public protests are for other people? protesting other things that they don't care about or agree with. If you only defend the right to protest for causes that you approve of, peopled by people like you, um, or go down well with the opinion polls and the focus groups, then you don't actually believe in the right to protest. Who would ever have thought that voting in authoritarian rules limiting our fundamental civil liberties would lead to that very basic right to gather in public protest peacefully being crushed by heavy-handed policing? As always, once again with the lockdown laws, be careful what you wish for. Right, uh, let's get to our first guest now at uh, eight minutes past seven. Uh, Tabitha Morton, who's deputy leader of the Women's Equality Party and a spokeswoman on violence against women. Tabitha, good morning to you. Hi, Julia. Good morning. Um, were you at the, uh, uh, at the demonstration, the vigil, the protest, whatever we're calling it on Saturday night? I wasn't. I was at a virtual demonstration. But I think this is quite distracting because what we need to focus on is ending violence against women and girls. And we have to make it a political and policing priority. Women are dying across the country and millions of women affected by this. So we cannot be distracted by this one incident. OK, we will talk about we will talk about those 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 uh, key stories. I mean, that, that's what this was about fundamentally. But let's talk just specifically first up, if we can, about the policing of this protest. You didn't attend this. This was supposed to be a vigil and it was organised. and They were trying. They went to court to get the right to have this event. They were told, well, the court basically said it's up to the police. The police said, no, you can't go ahead. And so the vigil was cancelled. Now, there's lots of arguments that actually they had a PA system. It would have been there would have been stewards. It could have all been socially distanced. It could have gone off safely. There wouldn't have been trouble. As it was, um, there were a lot of people, a lot of crowds. It looked to me, I mean, certainly from the footage I've seen, the people who were there, that it was actually, you know, almost entirely completely peaceful. There were some people with um, banners about the police. There were some uh, people shouting abuse at the police. But but largely the blame has been put on the police for going in heavy handed uh, and and dealing with. Do you think the police should have gone in at all? Or do you think that once those people had gathered that they should have been allowed to protest or, or hold their vigil? I think the police were given an opportunity to work with the organisers and they missed that, organ that opportunity. And the leadership of this shows the police attitude to women and to domestic violence and to violence against women. What do women you mean the police attitude? To women. The police's attitude. So just last year, two Met police officers were are alleged to have taken selfies with the murdered bodies 
of Nicole Smallman and Bieber Henry, those are still employed by the Met Police. You know, women are afraid of reporting to the police. We need to make this a priority and, and unpick the attitudes that the police and politicians have well, second, today. Two, you're talking about two officers who did something. That's not necessarily representative of... What, why is this representative of the police attitude to women? What about the, the protesters, the lockdown protesters, who, who have also had exactly the same treatment from the police? And a lot of those would have been men. Does that betray the police attitude? attitude to men when you look at the the convictions for domestic violence the convictions no answer my point no answer my point answer the question i've actually asked you rather than just talking about whatever you've got written down there (laughs) no i think this is all part of the bigger picture answer my question Go on, say your question again. Exactly, you didn't even bother listening to it because you were just going to say what you wanted to say. How can you say this this policing of this event showed the police attitude to women when the police, police, other events which involve men as well and men are arrested, does that show the police attitude to men? The police were given an opportunity to allow a peaceful protest to go ahead and they didn't allow it. So that, that, to me, shows everything you need to know about this. Well, no, 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 it doesn't. They didn't allow it because it's illegal under the current lockdown rules. It is not illegal. You can have COVID uh, safe. And the, the, the court actually ruled that, that the organisers could a- allow to have a COVID safe um, uh, protest. OK, well, I mean, there have been, been a choice they made. There have been a number, there have been a number of events in the last year, including lockdown protests, uh, where they, they, they could have been they, they, exactly the same number of people. Julia, same thing, and they've been you, policed just exactly Julia, the same. I wish you were putting so much energy into actually looking at how we end violence against women and girls. Well, we're not going to end violence against it. women and girls. That, that, Why is that? Because we're not going to end violence in society in total because that's well, not possible because unfortunately there are always going to be some violent people. But let's okay, we, let's talk about the generalities then. What we do don't you... even attempt to, to end violence and that's why we've got to make this a policing and political priority. Okay, so how are we going to end violence against women and girls? Well, first off, we need to make sure that it's a, it's a priority from national and local governments. We have to fund services so that we actually... Do you know that in this country it costs over £266 billion pounds, um, to deal with the effects of violence? Women's Aid report that you, if you actually just invested £393 million, pounds, you could deal and help to rebuild women's lives. So... We're just not even starting to do that. We need to make sure that the judicial system is overhauled as well. You know, in to this do country, what? in this country, um, rape has almost been decriminalised. Only two percent of cases were convicted last year. Yeah, but you know why cases are not getting convictions? It's because large number of the cases that come forward, there there is unfortunately no evidence that, uh, well, not enough evidence, certainly not beyond a reasonable doubt, when there are two people in a room, particularly if there has been that awful phrase date rape, where they've actually known each other, that that, that there's no evidence. You can't actually convict someone on someone say so. That that <laughs> is the reality. The conviction rates are so low because the CPS have made a decision to only bring certain cases forward. Uh, This has been highlighted by the the Victim Commissioner, Devira Baird, continually. These are decisions that are made that basically say to women that it's not what, what happens to you is not important. And that's why we're calling on Sadiq Khan in London, the national government, to actually make this a priority because we believe you can, Women's Equality Party believe you can end violence. This is not inevitable. You say it's not inevitable. There has never been a society in which there has not been violence. Now, we we live in a much less violent society, in a much less violent society towards women and girls in particular than any previous society uh, on on the planet. The world is a safer place for women now than it has ever been. We are going in the right direction. But the reality is, with all this focus on even conversations about 60 Third, outrageous suggestions like that. Ignore the fact that uh, that even if there is only sort of one man in a million who is a risk to women, women will still take precautions when they walk home at night, being careful, having the keys in their hand, you know, wanting to wear flat shoes so you could run rather than heels. Women take precautions all the time, even if the risk is very, very, very tiny. We're never going to actually stop all of the risk in the same way that, uh, you know, I, 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 the, I, I know that 400 people passing my home if I left my window wouldn't open wouldn't burgle me but one might I still have to close and lock my window when I go out we we have to take precautions against the the tiny number of people who are a risk don't we 
I don't think that 1.6 million women suffering from domestic abuse and three quarters of a million women reporting rape and, uh, and sexual assault is a small number. I think that's a huge number. And I think that we need to invest in our youth. We need to think about sex and relationship education for all of our kids. We need to talk about consent in schools. That's how we root this out. We need to start with the legislation and the police and the politicians, but we also need to educate our kids because one in five kids grow up in a home that sees domestic violence. So why? that's why we've got a violent okay. world around us. We've okay. got to root that out in families. I, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of teaching about sex and relationships and consent and the like. I think a lot of people, and, and I know I'll get shouted down for this, but as a woman, I'm sorry, I feel like to say, we talk about 1.6 million women living in domestic abuse relationships. I understand, I've spoken to enough victims of domestic abuse to understand how these are often very slow processes. And by the time you're in a situation where you are living in that abuse, often you have been isolated from your family, you are alone. Is, is not the first thing we should start to do is to make sure we get more of these women out of these homes? Absolutely. Absolutely, but I don't. I don't believe that we need to get them out of the homes. We need to m remove the perpetrators well, from them. Yeah. But and that's why I talked earlier about investing in services, community-based services that help women to understand, spot those signs and to rebuild their lives and move away from that. If this is a multifaceted thing, we have to invest in services, make this a priority nationally and locally and educate our young people and that's that's how we end it and you said you talked about the police attitude to women do you think there is fundamentally a problem with the police attitude to women and does that include Cresta Dick the Metropolitan Police Chief I think there's a societal attitude including the police and politicians a societal see, attitude in what they, way they see this as a women's issue they don't see this as a as a societal issue that men need to be part of this men are the the perpetrators here and they need to be part of this so yes of course the police well, no, 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 but men no but but the men the men who aren't the perpetrators of it the men who don't rape and kill and domestically abuse which is the vast majority of men what what you know they're, they're not responsible for it we're, they're responsible for calling out misogynist behaviour. They're responsible for call, dismissing well, so women. Exactly. And that's what we're doing. That's what you're seeing millions of women across the country doing. OK, Tabitha Morton, really good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Deputy Leader of the Women's Equality Party, uh, speaking on violence against women. Uh, Anna Vickerstaff, who attended the vigil on Saturday night and also attended the protests outside Scotland Yard in Parliament Square yesterday as well. Good morning to you, Anna. Morning, Julia. Thanks um, for having me. No, thank you very much for joining us. Now, um, there's there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of upset over what happened. Not only the upset, obvious upset from everybody across the the nation at the, the death of a young woman, uh, and of course, a, a serving police officer has been charged with that crime. Um, but uh, the the urge to have a vigil, I think a lot of people would understand. There was an outpouring of concern, uh, and, and some would uh, would say uh, grief and that, that that women wanted to mark Sarah Everard's death at that bandstand in Clapham. The organisers were told, though, that after even after going to court, that um, their, their event could not go ahead. The police would not work with them. Um, and the, in the event, they cancelled it. But the event effectively did go ahead without their organisation. Should people like you have gone along to that event, given that it was not actually allowed under the current lockdown laws? Are you and others who went along in some way partly responsible for what happened on Saturday night? Thanks, Julia. Um, so firstly, I think you're totally right. It was a response to a collective mourning, both for Sarah's death and also to um, it kind of in solidarity and protest of other forms of gender based violence. Other people have lost their lives to gender based violence. As someone who's experienced gender based violence, I was compelled to go along. Um, and I think we have the right to assemble and to collectively mourn and collectively grieve. And I think there's, there's no way that the, the attendees of that vigil can be blamed for the violence because it was I didn't, calm, I didn't it say was peaceful, blame. it was beautiful. No, no, of course, okay. Well, it was calm, it was peaceful, it was beautiful. People were respectful, they were mourning, they were grieving. And the only point at which it escalated to violence were when the police started to intervene, which okay. from where I was stood was completely unnecessary. The footage I've seen, again, there are lots of people standing around very peacefully, solemnly, uh, re remembering Sarah Everard's life. And I think, again, for like a lot of women who had attended like you, actually feeling a very personal uh, effect of, of this death, having, having experienced violence yourself. Um, however, the, the, under lockdown laws, 
that there isn't currently a right to assemble. We've seen repeatedly uh, police going in and stopping people peacefully protesting uh, uh, at events. There were also an awful lot of people, certainly in the footage I saw, which I've no reason to believe has been doctored, uh, quite a lot of uh, the people there, young women shouting, um, words I can't repeat on national radio, F the police, uh, holding up placards saying all cops are, and uh, a very rude word I also can't repeat. Um, there, were, there was an element at that protest which was not about peacefully and calmly remembering a young woman's life. They wanted trouble, didn't they? So, as I said, I was there. Um, I was actually opposite the the woman who we have everyone seen in the kind of infamous picture being pinned to the floor. So I was mm. very near the front. Um, and there was no uh, antagonism towards the police whatsoever until they started being violent with the crowd, at which point, obviously, the yeah. people in the audience were distressed. So that was when they started shouting at the police as a reactive measure because they were concerned for people's safety. Um, and this is why women don't trust the police to protect them, because this is how the police chose to act at what was a completely peaceful vigil until they decided to okay. intervene and start I mean, pinning them. A, undoubtedly, those scenes were pretty grotesque of uh, of a very burly big policeman uh, manhandling young women to the ground. And um, when you say women don't trust the police, you don't speak for all women. Plenty of women do trust the police, actually. I think this was very poor policing. But you obviously think that this was inappropriate policing. Were you also concerned about this kind of aggressive tactics being used against people who over the last year have met people peacefully to protest the stealing away of our civil liberties uh, against and against the lockdown. Did you defend those people as well? I'm a, I'm a fundamental believer in the right to assemble and the right to protest. I think that's a fundamental human right. And it's something that's being threatened by this new policing bill being rushed through. No, Parliament it's already threatened under the, the laws. No, but we'll come to that. Did you did you also speak out about the policing of those events? Were you also concerned about the policing of those events? Um, I am always concerned about the way police handle protesters. As someone that is a protester, it's something that I speak out about regularly. Mm -hmm. OK. And what, what is what is the purpose? I think a lot of people who most people don't go on protests from one year to the next. What is the purpose of either a protest about a woman who has been killed? We know that someone has been arrested and now charged for that event. That will go to court and we, we have to let those processes follow through. Is there anybody, as far as you're aware, saying, yeah, we're perfectly happy with, with young women uh, being killed on our streets? Every right-thinking person is horrified by that crime. Every right-thinking person wants justice done. Every right-thinking person wants women to feel safe on the streets and wants the wrong ones off the streets. I mean, what are you protesting against and what purpose will it serve? I think you're right. I think nobody is saying that this should be allowed to go ahead. But the question is, what are people actually doing about it? When we've heard in the week of International Women's Week that 97% of young women in the UK have experienced sexual violence. No, they, no, that, that... no, no, that is not what the survey said. And that and that's where you undermine yourself. You 97% say they have experienced sexual harassment. That's not the I mean, same I, thing. I would count sexual harassment as well. Someone whistling at you then. in the street, as irritating and annoying and downright rude that it is, is not sexual violence. Full stop. It's okay. Not. Let's let's call it harassment then. That's totally well, fine. Yeah, I'm happy, exactly. I'm happy to agree let's with you on that. Let's use the right words. Okay. Yeah. So sexual harassment. I still think that's staggering that 97% of people have experienced sexual harassment. And we also know that only 1.4 of all sexual assault cases ever go to sentencing. So that's what people are protesting about is the fact that people can say what they like about thinking it's a disgrace, but where is the action that we need to see? And because only 1.4% of uh, cases go to sentencing. That's why I'm saying, as someone that's experienced gender-based violence, I don't trust the police to handle it. And that's why I don't think giving more powers over to the police is a solution that we have, well, that we need here. And, and what, is it, what is it you don't trust the police about? It's because it's the Crown Prosecution Service that make the decision about, about cases coming to court. And I, I, I certainly know there are a lot of cases where the police don't, simply don't gather the evidence enough, but that's nothing necessarily to do with uh, you know, rape or sexual assault charges. That's in pretty much any, any area. There could be failings by the police in lots of different areas. Why is it you think the police uniquely don't care about violence against women? I mean, I think we've seen from that the, the point is that the cases never get to uh, sentencing. And so they must they must be being dismissed at some at but some Crown stage. Prosecution Service has the ultimate decision. And, and if a case has less than a 50 percent chance of of a, of a conviction, because there's simply no evidence other than a woman saying he raped me and him saying I didn't, then those cases have got a very poor chance of getting of having a conviction, in which case, what's the point of them going forward? 
I mean, as someone that was at the vigil and experienced the police pushing and shoving women who were doing nothing wrong, pinning women to the floor, trampling over Sarah's flowers, I think I have every right to not trust the police to uh, handle situations like that safely. OK. And does it change your mind at all, the fact that the the person in charge of the Met Police, who would have made the decisions about the policing ultimately, is Cressida Dick, who is a woman? She says she's not going to resign. Uh, is it relevant that she's a woman? She says she's more appalled, perhaps, because she's a woman by the, 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 the death of Sarah Everard. Uh, should she should she resign? I mean, I don't think the, that this is the fault of any one person. I think this is a deeply institutional issue. My issue is with the police, not any individual police officers. And that's why I'm so concerned about this policing okay. bill and handing over more powers to them. OK, and that, that policing bill, Labour said they're going to vote against that bill on Tuesday. Do you agree with them? Yeah, I really hope that they do. I think it's it's dangerous for so many reasons, not least our right to assemble and protest for the rights to our liberation. Let's uh, talk to former detective superintendent at Scotland Yard for 30 years, Shabnam Chowdhury, who joins me. Good morning to you, Shabnam. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. Now, um, I mean, the, the papers are full now, two days in a row with that event uh, on Saturday night, the vigil, which uh, ended up being uh, well, taken over by I mean, some some protesters, it had to be said, uh, but also the incredibly aggressive policing used uh, to uh, remove young women from the bandstand and others. Um, massive outcry, investigations, the prime ministers chairing a meeting of the crime and justice task force. The people have called for Cressida Dick, uh, the investigation Metropolitan Police Chief to uh, uh, to resign. She's denying resigning. It's all upgraded hugely between Labour now voting against the government's uh, police crime sentencing and courts bill on Tuesday. Um, what do you think went wrong on Saturday night and who is to blame? I think it went wrong before um, Saturday. Uh, the uh, organisers agreed that they wouldn't go ahead with the uh, the vigil on Friday, having had the response from uh, the, the Metropolitan Police that uh, that they couldn't uh, hold the vigil. So I think that what happened there was that the the policing response should have been different in that the you know uh, it was inevitable that hundreds of women were still going to turn up to pay their respects, to um, have their uh, voices heard. And I think that the whole day uh, there were gatherings, large gatherings of women and members of the community, local people, the Duchess of Cambridge. So people assumed, I'm assuming, that they could come along. 6 p.m. there were further more people coming along. And it was largely very, very peaceful. And then something went wrong um, at the point of the bandstand. And I believe that that uh, is when uh, the, the the handling of the women, uh, the, the, the photograph that you see of the young girl, the very young girl um, on the floor um, being held down by I mean, the police officers. I mean, this is it. I mean, just in terms of the, the optics of this, we're talking about young women meeting to whether vigil, protest, remember, mourn, whatever it was they were people do different things there uh, uh, the, the death of a woman for whom a, a, a serving police officer has been charged so far with uh, with her being responsible for her death for young women to be seen being manhandled by big burly male police officers was not a good look who would take that sort of decision though for the point of the police to go in in the way they did because uh, Cressida Dick the Met Chief has said well look you know you, you you can't blame the officers on the ground she's criticised armchair critics even though of course well we're not allowed to go and protest are we so we have to stay in our armchairs uh, to, to criticise but who would have made that decision at what level is it unfair to criticise those individual police officers how high up does it go and, and would Cressida Dick ultimately have made that decision? Well, the decision wouldn't come from Cressida Dick. Um, there's a few points. Let me just cover the first. The fact is we have a gold, a silver and a bronze response. Gold sets the strategy and silver would deploy the tactics. So the decision would have come from silver in terms of that. That would be a commander level who would have made the decision at the point at the bandstand when the speaker started and the crowd started to move forward uh, because they couldn't hear them. They didn't have loudspeakers. They could have had them if they'd have yeah. engaged with the organisers. And therefore, the decision was made at that point. I feel very sorry for the frontline officers. Those officers didn't want to be there. I've spoken to many officers who have cried in the last week with what has unfolded because the you know because of the fact that it was a police officer who has been charged with the murder. They had to do what they were instructed to do. And there this... is a certain amount of discretion. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, go on. Sorry. No, no, no I'm just going to say that's the thing. The individual police officers, whatever their actions, they were doing what they were told to do on the night. 
Yeah, well, look, they were engaging with, with the public beforehand. Uh, there were lots of conversations, from what I understand. Overall, it was largely peaceful. When that uh, position took place in terms of speaking, then that's what happened. Let's just go to the point that the Commissioner made around armchair critics. I think that's really unfair on the public because the general public are the critics and they are your they may be your harshest critics, but they're your best critic critics. These are the people that you want to engage with. Now, when you go forward and you look at how protests are uh, policed and so on, it may be that you want to go to the public to say, what was it about it that you liked or you didn't like? What would you perhaps do differently? So I don't think it's fair to criticise people that are sat in, at home in their armchairs. Um, and, you know, I'm an armchair critic. Mm. I've got 30 years experience. Does that now deny me an opportunity because I'm no longer in a police officer? Yeah. Is there is there an issue? We spoke to uh, a number of female sort of violent campaigners against violence against women. Um, is there an issue in terms of the police's attitude to women? Is there an issue in terms of uh, a sort of a shrugging of shoulders about what violence against women and women not being well feeling and or not being safe on the streets? Is that something that the police should be working on, or or is that simply a perception? I think, in fairness to the police, uh, the violence against uh, women and girls, uh, there's a huge amount of work that goes on with regards to police, how we investigate crime, how we provide support to victims, working with our partner agencies, all those sorts of things. However, clearly more can be done. Uh, the violence against women and girls, yes, we talk about violence, domestic abuse, we talk about forced man marriage, honour-based violence. Um, harassment isn't perhaps tackled in the way that it should be. And I think that these are the things that are now coming to the surface where women want to feel safe when they're out and about so that they don't have to deal with the unwarranted and inappropriate advances yeah. of men and boys out there in the public domain. And, and should anyone's head roll uh, when it comes to what, what's, what happened on Saturday night on the basis of either you know, Chris Dick, the woman in charge, um, Sadiq Khan, bearing in mind the, the, the mayor who is the policing, uh, policing commission and crime commissioner for, for, for London and oversees these policies. We We've seen very, very different policing policies when it comes to Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, the lockdown protest, this uh, this vigil and the protest on Sunday, uh, in protest at the dealing with the vigil. It does seem that the police pick and choose how they police events, deciding on whether or not they, they agree or disagree with the cause or whether or not it's a popular cause that might get them in trouble on the front page of the papers the next day or not. Look, in terms of uh, heads rolling, uh, the uh, mayor, the, uh, uh, the Home Secretary, uh, Boris Johnson has raised deep concerns about uh, the, the, the policing of that event on Saturday. Um, that is a matter for them now to decide whether or not the Commissioner should uh, start handing her resignation. And the Commissioner has been very clear that that's not what will happen, but that is a matter for them. So Tom Windsor has been appointed to undertake a full review on the events that led up to Saturday. So let's see what the outcome of that will be. OK, Shabnam Chowdhury, really appreciate you joining us. Former Detective Superintendent, great to get your point of view on that. Let's bring in James Price, he's a former Government Advisor now at Hanover Communications. Um, James, um, it, it's really interesting to hear from, from a former detective. I mean, the, these decisions are made at a very high level, aren't they? But then, of course, individual officers still have individual discretion, don't they? But, but a lot of people are just concerned about the general policy decisions, which aren't made by uh, you know, the PC you know, in Clapham Common at that moment. Yeah, exactly. I thought that was a, a perfect exposition of the of the whole setup there um, from from Miss Chadri. I mean, you know, uh, the idea that we're not allowed to be armchair critics, well, as we're not allowed to be critics on the streets either. Yes. I mean, there's almost a definition of some kind of weird police state there if we're not allowed to criticise them in any way, shape, or form. But where else does criticism of the of the Met come from? We've talked about the Home Secretary, talked about the Prime Minister. Again, I've said this earlier on today. The Police and Crime Commissioner for London is Sadiq Khan, and it doesn't seem that he's paid any attention to crime at any point since coming into office. Not anything just like this, but as you mentioned before, things like knife crimes. It's absolutely skyrocketed since Sadiq yeah. has taken over. There's the election coming up in a couple of, what, weeks now almost. It doesn't seem that he cares at all about the safety of people in London. All he cares about is putting his name on the side of things and uh, what, stop making it more difficult for drivers to drive in London um, and, and virtue signalling yeah. against Donald I mean, Trump. Yes, indeed. I mean, however, however one votes, and we're not going to really do what, what's going to happen in that election, it is extraordinary... Um, actually, for, for a mayor who's been in power for five years to say that actually the streets of London are less safe for, for, for half the population. I mean, that's an extraordinary admission, given that you're basically in charge of keeping those streets safe. 